Mike check one two, Mike check one two. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number one hundred and ten, I think. With me, your host Agostino. How you doing? How you feeling? How are you? It's been a while, hasn't it? Right? It's been an absolute while. It's been a hot minute since I've sat down in this hot seat and spoken to this hot mic and gave you my hot takes on the um, cultural events of the week. This podcast is going to be a little bit different than all the others because I'm going to recap my trip from Berlin. So if you're not interested in hearing about my stories about traversing through the mean streets of Berlin, then I recommend that you skip this episode and maybe tune into to tomorrow's one, which is be back to regular scheduled programming. Um, but if you're interested to hear what I, what I did, where I went, who I spoke to, my feelings and shit, then sit on down, grab yourself a cup of tea or a Kit Kat or something else healthy that you like to eat, like a banana or a bit of kale and a glass of water, and let's get comfortable and tune right on in to the Excellent English Show, episode number 110. But yeah, I'm happy to be back, man. Happy to be back in the land, you know, in, 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 in good old London, you know. Whether the summers are non-existent and the winters are long. But this year's been alright in it summer wise, so I can't really say that. But um it's good to be back. As you can tell from um if you're watching this via video, I've got a different change of appearance here. I've got his glasses on, right? That I bought from Berlin and one of my purchases. Well two what um one of my two purchases that I bought in Berlin. Um I didn't actually go that crazy with shopping. I did have a bit of money to spend, but I kind of, you know, uh spent my money on drinking and food. For the most part, and then the drinking kind of like, you know, it kind of subsided towards the end of the trip. And then I ended up just like, you know, spending most of my money on food. But um, I ended up buying these glasses from a shop, a little a little vintage shop somewhere in the middle of, um, where was it next to? I'm going to say Alexanderplatz, kind of near Alexanderplatz, right? So I went around there, had a walk around and bumped into the shop and they were selling these glasses for 10 euros. I thought, you know, what, why not buy them? But what makes these glasses even more incredible, right? They've got this, you know, this fucking fake lens shit. What, so it makes me look I'm like I'm super intelligent. But what makes it even more impressive, right, is when you get this bit here, this little extra glass bit, right, with magnets on the, on the back of it and you do this. You clip it and it transforms into sunglasses, like Oakley types with like reflective um, lenses. Amazing, no? So, you know, you, you, you can be, you know, you can be a, a hipster in the night and then during the day, you can be a trainee architect. Do you know what I mean? Like crazy, right? Look at that. Look at that. Look how intelligent I look. I'm not sure about glasses on me personally. Um, Again, maybe these glasses aren't the best representation of what glasses would look like on me because maybe they're a bit too big. Uh, maybe they don't sit as, maybe they don't sit right on my brow overall. I don't know, but you know. I got them from Berlin. They're a holiday gift, so I thought, you know what, fuck it. Let me just wear it for today and let you guys see how I might look in glasses because I do probably need to buy a pair of glasses. Um, my eyesight is a bit terrible, um, as anyone would know, that knows me would know. I, I don't really see too far. And then my second purchase um, at Berlin was this scarf um, from Borussia Dortmund. This Borussia Dortmund scarf, neon, right? So it's kind of a, it's the color of, of of the season, you know. Everyone's wearing neons this this season because the whole nineties revival is kind of in. Uh, rave culture is kind of come making a bit of a comeback. People are listening to trance again, so it feels like these sort of colors are really in vogue at the moment. Um, so yeah, I bought this. I found this in Vintage Shop too for five euros. So I'm not too happy. I'm not too uh, mad about that. So in total, I bought a pair of glasses and, and, a, and a Borussia Dortmund's vintage scarf for 15 euros. It's not too bad. I probably need to wash it because, you know, I did get a bit of a rash on my neck. But hey, you know, you got to die for fashion. Um, but yeah, happy with this. The only issue is I wore it a couple of times or towards the end of my trip. And I had a couple of guys um, bump into me and ask me, oh my God, wow, man. I, I support Dortmund too. Great, great scarf. And I was like, you know, and I, and I couldn't bring myself to like telling them, you know, I don't actually support Borussia Dortmund. I just bought the scarf. But... I was always opposed, or I'm, I am still opposed, to people who buy jerseys of clubs they don't support, right? It's something that always kind of really annoyed me. But I think that scarf, I didn't really see it. I, I don't think I saw the team. I just saw the colour when I bought it. I didn't really think, oh, people would think I support Bruce Dorman wearing a scarf. But, um, yeah, I got some funny looks from people in the middle of Berlin. Thinking, oh, this guy supports Dortmund. Okay, interesting. Well, I don't really support Dortmund, but I don't even wear a United scarf. You know, I think I think this sort of thing is a bit ridiculous. I think anyway. That being said, though, at most, if I was to go to a game, I would wear a scarf. At most, I wouldn't wear like a fucking jersey or a hat or like you know that Thai guy from Arsenal fan TV that wears like he's a, he's, like he wears a full kit, woolly hat, gloves, the fucking water bottle, the rain jacket. I couldn't do that. 
I think I'm too much of, an, of a grown man to go out there looking like a 50, like a 10 year old. That's not something I want to do. Um, I'm not that bothered about if your team loses and you have to come back on the train. And everyone sees that you've got the kit on and it's so embarrassing. I don't really care about that. I think it is what it is, right? Um, but it's just the idea of like wearing. Do you know what I mean trying to pretend like you play? What, what are you trying to do? Pretend like you're part of the coaching stuff. Pretend like you play football. It's just a bit strange. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I don't necessarily get it. Um, even sometimes when I used to play football in um, cages and shit, or for like you know, um, when you play football on those pitches that you got to rent, I forgot the name. The name passes my my head now. But sometimes even when I remember when I used to play football for a lot, well back in the day when I used to play football a lot, I used to sometimes just buy generic shirts, like just plain Nike shirts or plain Nike tops, like similar to a running top, just to wear, just because I didn't like the idea of even wearing a shirt from a team that had my name on the back of it, which I don't play for. It just sounds a bit cringy. I think the only way to get around it is to maybe buy a vintage shirt, you know, with a, with a player that's kind of long been forgotten or something along those kind of lines. That kind of, you know, works into it. Because I, all I remember all I remember for that kind of era was being a kid. And, you know, when you used to pretend what player you were. So I, cannot, I, can't, I can't imagine doing that when you're like, you know, 31 years old, pretending to be Ronaldo. Like, you're not Ronaldo, though. You know what I mean? Like, you should know how you play football now. I think when you're a kid, it's quite beneficial to pretend like you're Ronaldo, to pretend you're Figo, to pretend you're Rivaldo, right? It's quite beneficial at that time because you're trying to figure out what your playing style is. And then over a period of time, you'll kind of get a client. You'll kind of figure out what works best for you. Like, I remember this kid we used to play uh, football with in cage. Um, he used to pretend, he used to kind of, he used to basically take on Rolandino's mannerisms. Like, the, you know, Rolandino's mannerisms where he's sort of like shaking his head when he's running, flicking his leg all the time, like shaking his leg. Like the way he used to round, the way he used to like um, drop his shoulder. And um, he used to really, really copy Rolandino's mannerisms. But then over time, he kind of made it his own and he kind of did his own like kind of style of it. But I think when you're, you know, 31, when you're like 27 upwards, I think you should figure out how you play football and you don't need to have a shirt on your back with Beckham and then be whipping the ball out there with Beckham in order to kind of play like him. I think that's a bit losery. But yeah, those are my two purchases from Berlin. And what? So yeah, I got back on Wednesday. I shouldn't blow my nose. Hey, fever's coming back, y'all. Hey, fever's coming back. So I got back on Wednesday night. Um, Unfortunately... Um, or fortunately for me, I got some really cheap tickets to go to Berlin on the Friday of Berlin, um, which is great. Uh, the tickets were about, I don't know, 12, 13 pounds to fly out from Stansted, which was fucking awesome. Um, the, only, uh, uh, the only bad thing about it was that it was just like a 6 a.m. flight, um, which is, you know, if anyone knows that sort of flight that leaves out of Stansted, it's an absolute, you know, nightmare. It's good because you end up getting to your destination really early in the morning. So you get to kind of have the whole day to like, you know, do your shit. But... I'm such a shit traveler, even though I've traveled so much over the years, that regardless, if I, if I have a 6 a.m. flight, I still don't sleep at night. I will just stay up and then sleep for a couple of hours and then go to the airport. So you're absolutely wrecked by the time you land at the destination. And then you end up wasting a day. So I still have to figure out, I have to figure out a way that I can pack the night before or the day before. And then as soon as I get back home from work on that, on that Thursday night, if I'm leaving on a Friday morning, I can just sleep and then wake up really early. Like imagine if I was going to go for a run and just wake up early like I was going to go for a run and I said to go to the airport. Um, so I didn't do that well. And then I ended up, I ended up waking up a bit late on the Friday, um, like an, half an hour or 50 minutes late um, to get the coach. So I missed the coach. So I didn't have to get the, I had to get like a taxi to the airport. And luckily the taxi got me there in like 45 minutes, but it ended up costing me like 40 quid to get there. So that was a bit of a pain, but you know, it is what it is. Um, ended up getting to Stansted, it was an absolute, you know, death march there, like hundreds and hundreds of people uh, making their way to various destinations. Um, Stansted is a pretty quick airport to get in and out of, right? I think that's something that they've done really well. There's not much, uh, there's a, the only delay you get in Stansted is the people themselves, right? Because it's such a, because all the low budget airlines fly out from Stansted, plus a couple of other um, big airlines that, you know, a lot of people kind of converge at Stansted Airport. So the only real reason you'd have a delay on your flight would be the traffic coming in and out of that airport. But apart from that, um, apart from that kind of standard shit, everything else went quite swimmingly. Um, the plane came on time, ended up leaving on time. We ended up landing a little bit early than I thought we'd land in Berlin because I thought I was going to land uh, closer to about 11. We ended up landing about 10. 
and I end up getting to a city centre. No, I end up like closer to about nine. Sorry, I end up getting to a city centre just even before ten p.m. ten a.m. Sorry, in the morning, which is annoying because the reason why I had to stay in the hostel in Berlin, which is I'll get to later, was because I didn't, I couldn't. Um, all the Airbnb hosts that I was contacting to stay in their apartments, they kept saying that they were working on that on that day, obviously. So they needed me to come to the apartment before eleven, and I was telling them I was going to be there for eleven, so they couldn't necessarily agree to host me because I'll be there, I'll be too late for to get the kind of key hand of a shit. Anyway, um, that didn't work, and then I had to kind of uh, go into a hostel, and then the hostel itself was not too bad. Don't get me wrong; it was in a pretty decent location near Prince Lauer, Prince Lauerberg, which is uh, to the north of uh, Berlin. If you city center, if you like going north, east, south, west, it was basically towards the north. So it's not too shabby of a, of a location. Uh, I guess if you're a hipster, it's probably not the place you want to be at because most of the fun things are towards the east, the south, and maybe the west right maybe the southwest so some sort of similar to like london right you wouldn't necessarily want to stay in a hotel uh north of tottenham or whatever right you'd want to stay somewhere east south or you know central so um it was a bit out there but you know i didn't really mind it because again i'm on holiday i'm not necessarily bothered about traveling in and out of places um the hostel itself wasn't too bad but you know after staying in a hostel for a week with some kids and stuff in berlin i realized i'm way too old for staying in a hostel like i can't do that anymore i need to just like save up the money uh, book a hotel or book it ahead of uh, book enough time in advance to go stay in the Airbnb because I did find quite a lot of Airbnbs, uh, even apartments that I could stay in my own that I would have been able to afford, but I just didn't do it ahead of time enough. So, and of course, uh, as you know, with Airbnbs, you have to kind of contact the host, get the key. There's still a little bit, as great as Airbnb is, it's still a little bit clumsy, it's still, it's still a little bit laborious, it still takes a bit of time. There are some hosts on Airbnb who are super host who can kind of like you can, as long as the date is free, you can book it. And they kind of have, and they kind of treat their apartment like a quote unquote like a hotel in a way. So they have like an automated system in order for you to get the key. Whether if you come late, they can have somebody drop it off for you. They can leave it in an off license around the corner, and leave you with a manual in the in the home, so you can like read through where all the amenities are and stuff. So there are people that can do the kind of exchange of keys and details really quickly. But for the most part, it's just your average, it's just your everyday people um, with a, a space spare in their house that they want to make some money on. It's a bit annoying when someone fl flies at 11, 11 a.m. in the morning and you've got to go work and you don't, want, and it, you don't necessarily want to uh, book a holiday or take time off. So it's a bit annoying in that respect, I understand, but I probably should have just booked it ahead of time and I would have saved myself a lot of hassle. The, the, and yeah, like I said, the hostel itself was great. The hostel, um, the ho the shower, the kind of facilities itself was, was really nice. The bed was really comfortable, even though it was a bunk bed. Um, room was fairly warm. But just being in a hostel itself, like, you know, surrounded by, you know, young kids who are kind of eager for an adventure, eager to kind of like, you know, discover themselves, discover new things about the city. That kind of energy I just didn't need. It's really weird to say, to say that, but I kind of just need to be on my own. I just kind of like think about shit. I, I did a lot. I did a lot of thinking. I did a lot of meditating. Uh, I did a lot of being present in the moment. I did a lot of that. Even though I, I, I got, I got, I got, um, I got drunk sometimes, but I didn't get you know um, sloppy drunk where I was like falling all over the place or belligerent. I just got tipsy and got happy, and then I'd walk and I'd walk home, you know, and kind of get get some fresh air. And then whenever I felt tired, I'd jump on an on an on U bahn or an S bahn or whatever and go home. Um, so that energy I didn't necessarily need because I was kind of, you know, and plus being in a place where you've been a few times, you don't necessarily need that kind of like rah, rah, rah energy all the time. You kind of just need to relax sometimes. I think when you, need to go, when you go to a new place, it might be beneficial to go somewhere where it's a bit rah, 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 right? Because it's like that, that, that can take you on, that momentum can take you on a bit of an adventure. But when you've been there before, you kind of just want to just chill out and relax. So like I said before, I think in the future... I've kind of done away with hostels unless I'm going to be traveling in like I don't know throughout Southeast Asia and shit. There may be a hostel might be a good idea because most of those pla most of those locations don't necessarily have um, anything in between a, ho a, a kind of hotel and a hostel. It's just they all kind of like in, occupy the same sort of area, and usually hostels are a good um, place or a good base to kind of like situate yourself because then you can meet other other travelers. You can then maybe give recommendations places to go because some places you don't really find on the internet or you can find some travel buddies that you can continue the journey on with. There's loads of things that can happen once you stay in a hostel. So sometimes a hostel does work to your benefit. Um, so I read some notes of why of some thoughts I've had in terms of Berlin overall, which I'm going to kind of rattle through quickly. Um, so why I can't live in Berlin, um, I, I, I guess I, I, I realize that I can't live in Berlin because I don't think I'm 
mature enough to live there like um as a person right being able to separate like um l work and leisure time and also i don't think that kind of energy i don't think i need that energy now i think i have it right here in london i think i can have it in other places in the uk if we decide to move um i don't necessarily need to go to berlin like i'm happy that because we had a plan of moving to berlin a couple of years ago we were saving up to go and then i think we kind of like really fought back and thought you know what we haven't we haven't we haven't lived anywhere else apart from london right so it might be beneficial to actually move somewhere outside of london first and then once you move somewhere outside of london you can kind of get you know get used to the idea of paying cheap rent get used to the idea of accl acclimatizing yourself or getting familiar or getting comfortable or settling down in a new environment um and then from there the lessons learned from there you can then apply it to the other place you go so the next place that you go so the, so the idea was that you know if you want to move abroad it might be a good idea to kind of move away somewhere like don't just go from your parents house to straight away moving abroad it might be a good idea to kind of live on your own for a bit uh see how that feels see how you cope and then from there you can then decide to go and move abroad um so that was something that i kind of came to realization of and just in general i realized that you know what like i kind of bring the fun I, I am the fun, not not the fun for people, but I bring my own level of fun and my own level of excitement to things. So I don't necessarily need to go to a place to find the fun. Like I can, I have like, I have such a great time just hanging out on my own, just just being at home and not doing jack shit. But I don't necessarily need to go to places in order to kind of fill a void. And I think in years gone by, when I've gone to those kind of places, I feel as if I was maybe trying to fill a void. I was maybe trying to fill a gap. You know, a giant butthole gap that I had. And um, now I've kind of come, I've kind of got a bit more comfortable with who I am. You know, comfortable in my own skin. I feel a bit more relaxed, you know, a little bit more calm. Um, again, maybe it's old age. Maybe it's just like um, experiences along the way. But I kind of feel a little bit more relaxed, you know, a little bit more tranquilo. So that was a good realization to have whilst you're in Berlin. That you don't necessarily need to be in those kind of places in order to kind of feel like, you know, you're doing things. Um, I'd say weird observation but i'd say there's probably a little bit too many hipsters in berlin a little bit it's a little bit too counterculture for my liking like everyone is really trying hard to be weird now i don't know if that sounds strange but it's like a full-blown ex-occupation to be like really weird and quirky and into strange things and an observation i made right on on the train when i was sitting down uh, on the u-bahn or the s-bands and shit right um every girl that i saw sitting on her own was either reading a book, um, doing some sort of like, I don't know, knitting thing, or just something like creative with their hands. And then when you look down at their feet, they always had like really fucked up shoes on that were tied incredibly tight, like strangling, like type of level types of train trainers. And it's something that's always kind of irked me about some people that tie their trainers like that, like that kind of disregard of like, oh, I don't really care about shoes, you know, I just tie them wherever the, the um, shoes are just like structural elements, like um, structural. No, uh, what you call it? Uh, protective gloves that kind of, you know, um, protect me from the outside world or protect my feet from gravel and shit. You know, they don't necessarily glean any delight from the fact that they're wearing cool trainers. They just tie them really tightly, scuff them up, and it just look fucking horrible. So that kind of threw me off a bit. And then just generally how people are, you know, there's there's just kind of a it's kind of an aesthetic that's kind of a little bit too counterculture for my for my liking. Because uh, I'm again, I've never been someone that was always like like I, I, I love fashion right but i don't necessarily want to look like i love fashion i i hated that kind of like archetype i hated the kind of like i, I love hip-hop i look like i love hip-hop you know like new era hat big leather jacket big jeans and shit i just think it's so corny like it's like what everything in your life is about hip-hop like you want to have what hip-hop restaurant hip-hop cafe like it's just relax do you know what i mean there's other things outside of your genre of music that will might interest you or might kind of you know uh I don't know, that might give you some sort of insight into life in general. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily always need to be something that has to revolve around your little niche kind of subculture. And I think people are that always kind of, you know, it's a little bit clicky. You're always hanging around with people that kind of, you know, think like you, have the same sort of interest. It's a little bit, mm, a little bit too much for me. I'm not really a fan of that. I like, <clears throat> I like being with, I like being amongst um, humans. I like being amongst um, the general public right your average joes i love uh, that's what i like i don't like necessarily being in in places or in rooms of people who only hang out with people that look or feel like them I, I think that's a little bit corny a little bit cringe in my liking um the food as well i'd say is a bit overrated in berlin again that would be a over maybe someone will maybe shoot me through the head saying this but 
I think it's a bit overrated. I think outside of outside of the Turkish food, which is fucking amazing, right? Because I think living in London, we get once we get an, we get an element of Turkish food, right? Especially if you live in um, parts of East, parts of North um, London, we get an element of Turkish food, but we don't necessarily get the um, the real fucking shit, the real deal, uh, holy field. Turkish food that you get in Berlin, right? The mass of Turkish immigrants there have really changed the food landscape of Berlin, like probably forever. Um, so the, the Turkish food in Berlin is just insane. Like any kebabish you go to, you can get like some food, some Turkish food that you never probably had, and some Turkish food that you're, you know what I mean, that you're surprised they even make. So that's amazing. Then there's a great Asian food too, right? There's a there's a pretty good um, Vietnamese, uh, Korean. And not that much Chinese, but there is a few Chinese places that you can, can go to. There's a really good few uh, Japanese places that you can go to too to get some sushi and shit. So outside of the Turkish and Asian cuisines, I'd say the food is quite average. It's quite overrated, like especially the German food. If you don't like if you don't like meat and potatoes, then you're not going to be a fan of it. If you're not into like, uh, if you're not into like, um, what you call it? Fried chicken fillets. You're not going to be in or breaded fried chicken fillets like schnitzels and shit. You'll be a, not over it. Um, not that much into it either so i say the food is a bit overrated overall it's kind of it kind of kind of get a bit samey which is why i saw quite a few people who are the same sort of age group as i am walking around the street with loads of vegetables and shit in their hands so i think a lot of the population in berlin because the fresh produce is so good are vegans or kind of have that you know most a mostly vegan diet with maybe some sprinkling or, or mostly vegetarian diet with some sprinklings of protein in it because obviously the fresh produce in Berlin is really fucking good. Like some of the markets there are really, really good. The vegetable markets, like you can get some really good stuff there. Um, but yeah, just eating meat and potatoes every day must get boring. Again, maybe when it's cold because the Berlin winters are nothing to play with. That could be a good thing to go with because, you know, there's there's nothing better than meat and potatoes when you're, you know, in the freezing um, sub-zero temperatures. But I think the food's slightly overrated. Um, I would say... It's not the most beautiful city in the world, which is something that everyone knows. You know, it's not something I'm, I'm, I'm not. That's not like a hot take in that regard. It's not the most beautiful city in the world. You're not gonna, you're not gonna go to Berlin in order to see the beautiful sights. It's no Paris. It's no Rome. Um, uh, that's for sure. So it can be a little bit depressing sometimes, especially if it's not hot. I realized when I went in the summer, when I went earlier on in April. I realized just how beautiful the city was when it's hot. Especially like, you know, when something when something's so dilapidated and so run down, there's a little bit of a beauty in it. Have you ever seen those pictures of like um uh um towns and villages in like Afghanistan and shit that have been bombed but people still live in and amongst the ruins? And there'll people someone will take like a, an amazing portrait or an amazing landscape shot of a family in a in a you know, in a in a fucking rubble, like still living in a, in a rubbled shack. Um, inside Afghanistan or whatever, right? And it looks beautiful, right? There's something about the sun hitting those buildings, right, that are crumbling, that are dilapidated, and the, and the kind of strength for that family to kind of still hold dear, to still stand tall, still stand strong in the middle of their property, even though it's been fucked up. There's something quite beautiful about it. And you can kind of see the same sort of thing when you're in Berlin, right? All the graffiti, all the kind of like, you know, all the kind of brutalist architecture, right? Um, The kind of remnants of uh the you know of the war kind of lingering in the air and the sun kind of like beating against it you can kind of see the beauty in it somehow but when the temperatures drop a little bit and it gets a little bit look gets a little bit wet and it gets a little bit muggy you can kind of feel a little bit uh, do you know what I mean this isn't the most beautiful place in the world it can kind of bum you out slightly and then if you go to especially if you go to like really fucked up ends or, or fucked up areas of Berlin, which I won't mention, you can kind of really think, Jesus Christ, man, there's literally no beauty in this place whatsoever. So that can be a little bit of a bummer. Again, if you live in a really beautiful city, it can be a little bit of a um it can be a little bit of a shock to the old retinas. Um what else I mentioned here. Da, 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 da. Um, oh, um the females are very um I wouldn't say dirty looking, but you get people like that in London too, guys, right? Have you ever have you have you ever seen someone in London and kind of and kind of thought to yourself, does this person sleep in an ashtray? You know that kind of look, like it's kind of ashy and kind of dusty. It's like they they can never quite get that kind of um smog off them. It sort of looks like their train broke down in the middle. Of the, their Central Line train broke down um in the middle of a tunnel and they had to kind of walk along the tracks. Um. 
yeah, like they they all have that kind of look. Uh, the females and the guys in in Berlin. So if you're somebody, if you're single and you want to go out to Berlin and you want to find a mate and shit, um, maybe if you go to other places in the center of Berlin, it might be a bit different. But if you hang around with hipsters and shit, you have to get used to that different kind of beauty. It's a di- again same same with the architecture in Berlin. You have to get used to seeing girls who don't necessarily always try and look pretty which i think is one of the liberated things about probably being in berlin if you're a female or if you're or if you're a guy that comes from a, a place like london for instance where it's very there even though there's a lot of hipsters here a lot of people that look dirty there is a lot of um credence and a lot of um importance given to your image and how you look and how you present yourself right uh, maybe that goes back to the whole idea that we're like a, a mostly classist society right um uh, maybe that goes back to that kind of like I don't know what it is, but there's there is a lot about your image. Like for instance, if, if you worked in this is weird, but if I'm, I'm I'd imagine if you're a young girl and you want went to intern for L magazine, you'd have to look the part when you went to the interview. You couldn't just turn up in anything. It would severely impact um, your success in the interview. Even if you had all the knowledge, even if you knew everything about L, if you're knowledgeable about its target market, if you're knowledgeable about the people that it highlights, the brands that it highlights, the things that people would be interested in reading in it, if you had cool ideas and expanding its reach and acquiring new readers, all that stuff would still pale in insignificance if you turn up to L magazine just wearing like some shitty outfit that you got from Primark. Like it'll really hurt your your chances of getting that job. Whereas I feel like in Berlin. No one necessarily cares what you look like as long as the inside, as long as what you're talking about, as long as you're, you're kind of clocked on up there, that can really help your chances. So there's a, it's, again, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a culture switch you have to kind of get used to if you're kind of moving from a place like London where, you know, for the most part, the cool, the cool hipstery kind of creative design um, it, um, scene it, it's very heavily rely on your image, how you present yourself on social media, how you present yourself in real life, the parties that you attend, the parties that you don't attend. It's very, very important how you move around and navigate around the city. Whereas in Berlin, you can kind of do your own thing. You can kind of bounce around places. You can kind of not give a fuck. And it can kind of add to your level of appeal, your level of mystique. Um, and again, like I said, it, it could also have a detriment effect because if you're somebody who's used to uh, seeing people who look really beautiful, who spend a lot of time putting themselves together, it can be a bit of a cult, it can be a bit of a culture shock to kind of be like, whoa, Jesus Christ, man! Like, do you know what I mean, like they don't care at all. Like the bar, one of the bartenders um, at this bar I went to in um, what was it in Neukölln, uh She had like armpit hair. Like that was protruding out out of her arms. I, I just I was like just that walk like you know with the vest top on. That was like kind of sticking out. So it's like, and that's a, and then I think that might be the first time in a few years I've seen a girl with armpit hair. Like pur- purpose one of it, not like you know stubble. Like actual like you know she's kind of like all about liber- liberating herself and not being confined to the social norms that girls are to share their armpits and stuff. Whatever she might she probably has her own stance on it. And um, you know what I mean more power to her. But you have to get used to seeing that kind of thing. You have to get used to being in an environment where people don't necessarily um you know pres- uh, prescribe themselves to social norms. They don't necessarily bend or curtail to what people want them to look like. And um, you kind of have to kind of adjust to it yourself. You know, when, you, when you're in that environment yourself, you kind of have to kind of allow your eyes to get used to seeing these kind of things. Um, what else? Uh, oh, the shoes people wear. This interesting part. So I'm going to do, uh, probably going to do a post about it on my blog to check out, check that out at defaultgoon.com. I haven't updated in a while, but check it out. Anyway, um, I say the top five shoes people are wearing in Berlin. Number one, Dr. Martens, which is obviously something that everyone can, you know, is very aware of that someone wearing Berlin, uh, you know, the terrain, uh, there, the loads of rubble, you know, I, I stacked over f- uh, 100 million times, you know, there's loads of pavement slabs kind of protruding out of the floor, so Dr. Martens are kind of a good sturdy shoe to wear all day round, so I'm not surprised about that. Shoe number two was, you know, the Adidas Calabasas, you know, the shoe, you know, the, you know, the GR version of it, the one has got that sort of like a Gucci line print, a Gucci print towards diagonal on the side of it it's like it looks like the adidas calabasas shoe right the kind of like um adidas version of the reebok workout but with a thinner sole 
So there's that, there's like a GR version of it that Adidas have made uh, that comes in like neon yellow, white and other kind of other neons. I think it comes in like a pastel pink that's all over Berlin. I'm sure people are only wearing it because it's on sale and it was really, because I think even retail, that shoe is really cheap. I think it's like 62 pound or something. So I'm sure they bought it because of sale, but those, that's another popular shoe. The third popular shoe in Berlin is a Buffalo sneaker, whether it's uh, the high or the low. Um, Buffalo shoes are sort everywhere in Berlin. Um... The third shoe would probably be the Reebok Classic. Like the classic Reebok Classic with just the, the kind of tip of the front. That everyone wears in lows. And then the fourth shoe that I saw that was really popular in Berlin. Ah, oh, Air Force Ones. Uh, white or black standard they're all the first popular ones so as you can tell like really robust shoes i didn't see a lot of people wearing vans for the most part i didn't really see a lot of people wearing vans maybe i saw wearing vans were like the turkish the young turkish girls um the kind of like the hood girls whatever they were wearing a lot of vans so that kind of similar to what the girls in london wear the hood girls are wearing hirachis and now wearing vans so that's sort of a similar look with the skinny jeans and leather jackets and shit but for most of the hipsters it was dr martin's um, those GR versions of the Adidas Calabasas, the B Buffalo Sneaker, the Reebok Classic and the Air Force One. Those are the kind of like basic, most popular shoes that were around Berlin. Um, what else is on my list here? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, I, I was, but the one thing I was really inspired by was the, was just the independence of people, the creative kind of independence or the lifestyle independence of people. You know, like I'd walk out of my apartment or I'd walk out sorry, of, the, of the hostel at various times of the day, whether it would be 9, um, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7 p.m. And you'll see different people just hanging around, having a chat, um, mostly Berliners who or people that live in the city, um, people buying bits of fabric, people, I don't know, getting a coffee and shit. And it was nice to see that... <laughs> There is a segment of the population that lives in Berlin or segment of population. Seg there is a segment of the world's population, especially young people who are living life um, via the beat of their own drum. Right. They're not necessarily uh, clocking in to a nine to five. They're not necessarily answering to anyone. They're doing what they want to do and leading their best life. Right. They live. They're living a creative life. They're doing things that they want to do in this time that they have available. And I think that's something that's super inspiring. Come, you know, living in like living life in a place like London, where everyone's sort of like in this kind of in, um, never-ending rat race, uh, always looking for the next cookie, um, always looking for the next adventure, always looking for the next salary, always looking for the next job, always looking for the next adventure. It can sometimes feel as if like there is never an end, there is never a finishing line to the race. But I've always had long held the aspiration or long held the dream that I would want to have my own future in my own hands, you know, my own destiny in my own hands. Uh, I want to have, you know, um, be able to um, feed myself via the sweat of my own brow and not have to answer to anyone. And being in an environment somewhere like Berlin where everyone is doing it, where, a, sorry, where the majority of people are doing it is great um, confidence boost because it lets you know that it's not an outlier thing. Because in London, sometimes people can make you feel as because people are not necessarily good at passing on information, right? If somebody is kind of doing their own thing in London, they're quite sh they're quite hush hush about it. They don't necessarily want to let you know how they got around to doing it because they realize how easy it is to do, and if more people do it, it necessarily it's going to encroach on their chances of being a success, which is quite stupid, uh, of course. But people have that kind of um, famine. Uh, scarcity sort of mentality, right? They don't necessarily think that there's an abundance of opportunity, which there is because we've got the internet. But being in Berlin and seeing people kind of going for it and doing their own thing is really, 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 really inspiring to see people of um, that are kind of in my same age bracket or just kind of doing their own thing, you know, living life, having a good time um, and, and enjoying the time they have available, the time that they have on this, on this earth, doing the things that they enjoy and spending um, the time with people that they like. And that's something that is, you know, is kind of can it can kind of go a little bit unnoticed or a little bit um, under the radar here in London, but it's something that people need to kind of think about a lot because we don't get that much time here, man. We're not going to, you know I mean? Like time, life goes by in a fucking flash. Look, it's October already now. Christmas is only around the corner. Um, then it's New Year's Eve. Then it's, another, it's a whole other year again. Um, the worst thing I can imagine is to be spending my time in servitude working for other people for the, the entirety of my life. Do you know what I mean? There needs to be, there needs to come a time where enough is enough and i stand on my own two feet and i declare independence <laughs> but yeah uh, that was good to see um people just doing their own thing in berlin overall well see what's my time because i've got a jet off soon um ba, 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 ba. oh of course the burger was amazing um i got into the burger kind and i saw dj harvey play which was fucking sick on the sunday um they had this night called club knacked 
or Club Notched. I don't even pronounce it. Um, the actual word, but they had this party going on from Friday until the Monday morning, which was fucking awesome. I ended up seeing Harvey on the Sunday afternoon. Um, no, Sunday evening, sorry. He played from 8 in the evening until 11. So I got there about 9 and saw him play for the last few hours. It was fucking insane. Uh, queuing up in Burkhine, of course, you know all the stories. You know, just, just don't be a prat in a queue, basically. All that stuff about not making noise, not talking is a bit overstated. Just don't be a dickhead in the crowd, in the queue. So I got, I, I was, I, I was lucky enough to get in, even though there was quite a lot of people in front of me who were getting turned away, which was quite upsetting. But I, fortunately, fingers crossed, I was able to get in. I got into Burkhine, uh, paid my 15 euros and had an amazing time, man. Like, it was so good. It was so cool to be in a burger kind sober. Like, I got... Because I, I, I decided I was going to just have a drink when I got in there. Um, so, when I got in, I started having drinks or whatever. But it was so nice to kind of actually feel and be present in that environment. And kind of just... Just just kind of... You know I mean? Just kind of center myself in that environment of music and techno and um, sexual liberation. And people just being free and doing what they want. It was so, so... Um, so liberating in general. And again, just that presence of mind, just to kind of be present in the moment too. I wasn't chasing anything. I was just enjoying my time there. And obviously having a person like DJ Harvey play, it kind of really added to the whole ambiance of the whole evening. It was just an amazing experience, man. That space, the Burkhine, is just something else, really. Um, it, and it kind of needs to be stated that the whole, like, not taking pictures in there really creates a different environment. I know I've been in it, I've been there a few times now, but you really get, you really get it. Like, no one's on their phone, even on their toilets. Like, no one's kind of, like, checking their phone. Everyone's just, like, really present in a nightclub. Like, just hanging around, chatting, um, sharing a cigarette. Um, I don't know, sharing other substances, <laughs> whatever they may be. You know, exchanging fluids. Um, everyone's just really present. No one's, like, faffing around. Everyone's just having a good time. And, oh, my God, talk about having a good time. People are dancing. Everyone is dancing, man. Dancing, dancing, dancing. It's amazing to see. Absolutely amazing to see. And yeah, I can't wait to go back again, man. Bergheim was fucking incredible. What an amazing space. And what a privilege. Again, it's absolute privilege to be able to go away to these kind of places and, and actually, um, you know, and experience them and live them for real. Not kind of have to read about in a Guardian article or watch a YouTube video. Actually go there and experience something itself. I'm really, really big on that. I think people don't do that enough these days. You know, they, they're quick to kind of make an assumption about something or say something something that they don't like whatever it may be but not necessarily going and visiting the place or kind of hanging out there just like you know whatever everyone's got kind of like um what's the thing called a um couch quarterback sort of opinion of things but yeah the burger was fucking amazing I ended up leaving there monday morning at like nine when it ended and when the sun come up everyone was there having a good time it was fucking incredible i can't wait to go back again burger i love you um, and that might be a good place to end for now. A little half an hour recap of my trip to Berlin for the most part. So I'm going to come back um, tomorrow with my regular schedule programming. So I won't include any Berlin, mo no more Berlin talk because I know that can kind of get a bit boring after a while. Especially when you know someone is always banging on about a holiday and you, you never went. It can get a little bit annoying sometimes. I know, I know, I know. So regular schedule programming will be back tomorrow. Um, thanks again for tuning back into the Excellence English Show. It's always a pleasure to speak to everybody. Um, as always, all my links and all the information can be found below at excellencezinger.com. I'm DJing this Friday at the um, Tap East. I'm back at Tap East DJing for a night called Tap, so you can find information on my website. I'm also DJing next week Friday, next week Saturday, next week Friday again. So it's an absolute chocker block um, uh, time in my life as per usual and you can find all the information at my brand new website redesigned now it's hosted on squarespace so you can find that link below xlzinger.com it's all nice and squarespace there like nice links and shit everything comes up as it should so you can find a link below um, on the show description and i'll see you guys again sometime tomorrow thanks again for tuning in take care peace